Thank you, President Park, for the kind introduction. I also want to thank President Lin and Chairman Hao, uh, the host of this opening ceremony. And of course, I applaud the uh, Beijing Municipal Commission on Education for co-sponsoring the annual forum, along with Peking University and the Korea Foundation for Advanced Studies. It, takes, it does take a village to produce a great conference, and uh, I appreciate all of you coming together to make this happen. So today, I'd like to focus on a profound change sweeping across academic institutions around the world. And it's that increased collaboration and cooperation among world's universities, truly a qualitative change over the last few decades in the way universities interact with one another. So to provide some personal context and truth in advertising, I've spent nearly all of my life in academia as a student, as a scientist, as a professor, and now as chancellor at the University of California at Los Angeles, or more commonly UCLA. Uh, by those, those of you outside the academic community, universities and colleges are sometimes assumed to be resistant to change, mired in their traditions. You see that in graduation with the graduation garb. But in my experience, those are just assumptions. They're just that, they're assumptions. The academic institutions of the 21st century never stand still for long. What we discover, what we teach, how we teach, these critical forces in the university life are forever evolving, forever moving forward. There is a huge amount of churn going on in institutions throughout the world. In my research as a neuroscientist, I found that each question, of course, only answers additional, it raises an additional set of questions. Expanding knowledge creates ever more need for more expanding knowledge. Uh, the work is really never done in academia. And knowledge and ideas, which of course are the uh, coin of the academic realm, as we all know, tend not to be contained within borders. Borders are highly permeable to knowledge. The academic community has long been a catalyst for international cooperation. I really believe we have often been at the leading edge of developing relationships between countries and certainly in sharing knowledge. We reach across borders very effectively, develop partnerships, welcome student exchange, and address common challenges. We really are at the forefront. Consider a handful of examples of the impact academic communities and their members can make on world affairs. You know, universities have amazing impact. As, a, as the university student in Edinburgh in the 1820s, Charles Darwin studied with geologists, zoologists, and doctors throughout Scotland and England. He attended lectures by an American ornithologist named John James Audubon. A few years later, the young Englishman sailed for South America uh, aboard the Beagle, an expedition that would transform permanently our knowledge of the scientific world. Again, in 1901, the very first Nobel laureate in medicine was a German doctor who helped develop the use of serum therapy against infectious diseases. One of his research collaborators was a Japanese doctor who would later found a research institute in Japan, as well as the first medical school at Keio University. Again, international collaborations are longstanding and have existed for a long time. So there's a track record in the interna of international collaboration in the academic community and a track record of wielding soft power, intellectual power, to play a pivotal role on the world stage. What's different today, in my view, is the scale and velocity of this academic connectivity. I think really leading to a qualitative change in the way we interact. This is true at UCLA. It's true at universities around the world. It's certainly true at Peking University. But let me linger a bit on the university I know the best of UCLA to talk about what's happening there. So as we meet here today, UCLA students were in the rainforest in Cameroon gathering, gathering data to enhance conservation of critical natural resources. In Costa Rica, a UCLA professor's research on monkeys is altering our understanding of how animals learn and communicate with one another. And in South Africa, a UCLA student right now, an entrepreneur, is delivering low-cost solar-powered lights to replace dangerous kerosene lamps. And I should note, this connectivity most often flows in both directions. And a great example is here in Beijing. UCLA doctors are collaborating with colleagues at the Beijing Children's Hospital Group and Futang Research Centers of Pediatric Development to improve the health, well-being, and happiness of pediatric patients throughout China. And what we learn in China can directly be applied to the US. What we learn in the US can directly be applied to children in China. And here at, at Peking University's Joint Research uh, Institute uh, we're, for Science and Engineering will mark our 10th anniversary of collaboration in computer science, engineering, and other areas. 
down the road at Zhejiang University, we have a joint diagnosis center where we work with doctors to diagnose some of the most complicated cases that hospitals in, uh, in Hangzhou uh, see. So again, strong collaborations. In Los Angeles, UCLA offers a summer program to bring nearly 100 Chinese undergraduate students to campus for a 10-week intensive training program with UCLA professors. These are some of the most dazzling students you'll ever meet from China that come to UCLA and then go back to China, go to graduate schools in China and in, in the US and other countries and make a difference, but have been transformed by their international experience. I could go on and on, but it's very clear that you know, learning dissemination of the fruits of research knows no borders. It's truly international. And this is true in a global sense, but also in California, it's true in a local sense. UCLA, which is the University of California at Los Angeles, with an obligation to focus on Los Angeles, doesn't stick too close to our boundaries on campus. Uh, we affect our community, obviously, of Los Angeles. We affect the state. But increasingly, we are affecting the entire world. We really are a global university, one of those 21st century global universities. It's certainly true in health area. It's true in technology and in industry and in the arts. Almost every sphere you can imagine, most of what we do has become international in its focus. And again, uh, using UCLA as a focus, it's possible to see the forces that are driving international collaborations to new levels. I talk to a lot of UCLA students, and when I talk to them, they are global in their perspective, certainly international in their perspective. They see themselves as future citizens of the world. They really look beyond their state, beyond their country. They understand that most of the issues in, uh, that we face are, in fact, international issues that require global viewpoints. So this clearly is, is happening with our students. Part of this is brought about, we all recognize, by changes in technology, which brings us closer together. So when I graduated from Stanford in the early 1970s as an undergraduate, we had one large computer on campus, an IBM 360, that occupied an entire building. An entire building computer was taken up with, uh, with computing activity. Now, most of our students walk around with literally supercomputers in their pockets, each tens of thousands of times more powerful than early computers. And that has created enormous interconnectivity. I mean, with a couple of swipes, their smartphones can take these students to any part of the world. Naturally, this feeds their curiosity and certainly feeds their sense of connectedness. So I think, again, that technology has had a really a profound impact on our, our sense of being a, a, a the, part of the human larger population. As UCLA researchers understand a great numbers of human challenges are global in nature, as I said. Climate change, for example, affects all of us. At the same time, new knowledge is not the province of any one university or state or nation. The pursuit of knowledge sits at the core of the modern university's mission. Access to knowledge has become more democratized, actually dramatically democratized over the last decade, leading to really tectonic shifts in the world and society. The World Wide Web has dramatically reduced the cost of information. It is available to everybody. And as students become ever more curious about the world, research becomes increasingly interconnected. And it only makes sense for universities like UCLA, like Peking University, to begin to perceive a mandate to deploy their efforts when appropriate to serve a more global constituency. Two years ago, the UCLA campus embarked on an initiative called the Depression Grand Challenge, a massive multifaceted effort to combat one of the most pernicious challenges to brain health. Depression afflicts more than 300 million people worldwide. In the United States alone, depression costs us billions of dollars in lost productivity, not to say uh, unhappy lives. Globally, it takes an immeasurable toll in terms of human misery. As I think about this brain health condition, I'm astounded that depression has not been identified as perhaps the number one health issue facing humanity. So at UCLA, we decided that we had an opportunity, indeed an obligation, to rally our resources around the cause of combating depression. The Depression Grand Challenge encompasses a range of activities, foremost among them research collaborations among 100 UCLA researchers, as well as researchers internationally from, from really around the world, and it's a focus on psychiatry, psychology, computer science, economics, world arts and culture. Everybody's involved in this. This is something that has to be uh, multi-dimensional in, in one's approach to it. The Depression Grand Challenge aims at nothing less than a transformation in how depression is detected, diagnosed, and treated. And this is the piece that's relevant to our conversation today. 
As new ways to detect and treat depression and related conditions are discovered, we first apply them to our own community that really becomes our, our test bed, but very quickly these become treatments, therapies available internationally. What we learn will get spread rapidly. Indeed, the work already has taken on international dimensions. A key researcher for this grand challenge is a UK citizen and former Oxford University human geneticist, uh, Jonathan Flint, who recently moved to UCLA to undertake a 100,000-person genetic study of depression, understanding the genetic correlates of uh, depression. But his current study is here in China, where more than 10,000 women actually have been analyzed and, uh, and to better understand the roots of depression in women in China. That work is, is directly applicable to what we'll be doing at UCLA. So again, this already is an international effort at, at its get going. On the treatment side, so we also provide treatment, obviously, as well as research, our lead psychologist is from Tasmania. And the online protocol we're de developing to treat mild depression was developed by a scientist working in Australia. So I just offer this as an example of the kind of collaboration that, anim uh, that animates international, the international academic community today. We look rapidly across borders for the best talent. We grab the best people to collaborate with. This is going to be the way for the future. We will always have international collaborations in our large efforts. Uh, so by doing this, you know, we, we really are, I think, representing a new type of university that I think is, uh, is going to change the way we do scholarship. There was a, this, so this is very interesting. This is from 1910, so many ideas are not so new. Uh, there was a new form, this is, this is a mention about California universities in 1910. There's a new form of university coming which is foreshadowed in California. A study on American universities predicted uh, that greater and more influential than state or national universities, this will be an international university of the future. So even in 1910, uh, we saw in California the belief that we were going to have international institutions. And more than a century later, and with each passing decade, that forecast seems to be more and more prescient. That's how the modern research university is evolving with an international spirit and an awareness of what soft power of academic collaboration and cooperation can bring to bear on collective human understanding. In that same spirit, I expect that's what's brought all of us here together today, uh, and I applaud the important work that is being conducted here. But we cannot be uh, satisfied with self-congratulations. In terms of international academic community, there is really work to be done, and certainly work to be done in our homes, in my home in Los Angeles. And here's the challenging part. The importance of global collaboration is not always understood by those who are not engaged in it. Critics sometimes ask, why don't we stick to our state or region when it comes to research? Why, this is important, why do we accept any foreign students at all? Certainly California has, you know, 38 million people and there are lots of students. We have more than 100,000 applications for admission each year. Why accept foreign students? Why accept students from China or from Europe or from any other part of the world? We need to provide answers to address these concerns and we need to provide those answers broadly and convincingly. We must be advocates for exploring human challenges in a global context, mindful that this will create knowledge that will help resolve local changes as well. We really have to educate the population about the importance of our interconnectivity. We also need to remind people who live outside the academy that an enrollment of foreign students, if done reasonably, fairly, and at appropriate levels, leavens the campus experience for all who attend. I would argue it transforms the campus, the presence of international students, Chinese students at UCLA, make a huge difference to all our students. For young Californians, a reasonable influx of international students provides a chance for them to meet and learn from contemporaries who grew up in countries with different histories and perspectives. And many UCLA students, because we're truly a public university, because their economic issues and other constraints may not be able to study abroad during their time on campus. Unlike students that are more, uh, more affluent, many of our students simply can't afford to spend time in another country. So a mix of international students can help provide this missing component to their educational experience. So their international experience, much of it will occur on the UCLA campus by having students in their living units, in their eating halls from other countries. These, experience, those, these experiences prepare all of our students to participate and hopefully flourish in what promises to be an ever more connected world. And this brings me to my final point. 
A little more than 50 years ago, Clark Kerr, who was then the president of the University of California, and I think probably the most famous president of the University of California, gave a series of much circulated lectures at Harvard University. In these lectures, Kerr traced the evolution of universities from Plato's Academy to the models of Oxford and Berlin to the modern, highly compartmentalized and complex universities that he called the multiversity. The multiversity would, be, would come to become the model for most major universities today. So in the 1960s, Clark Kerr clearly, sir, clearly saw where universities were evolving and what they would look like today. I think he was quite, uh, quite accurate. In his time, however, Kerr's multiversity was often misunderstood, just as the invigorated international reach of universities today can be misunderstood. As Kerr said in his lectures, quote, this great transformation is regretted by some, accepted by many, gloried in as yet by few, but should be understood by all, end quote. In a similar vein, I believe a critical task before us today is to make the case broadly and deeply uh, that the value the, or the necessity of collaboration and cooperation among world universities, there is a necessity for us to engage deeply if we want to remain excellent, if we want to continue to have leading universities, those universities must be deeply interconnected. This is a force of good in our time, uh, and it's one that needs to be understood by all. So I want to thank you for your time and your attention. I appreciate it.